All right, I'm gonna dedicate this video right here. Unit three, we're looking at three topics in culture to guarantee a three, four, five. Let's go. First one, my kids are always emailing, Mr. White, what's cultural landscape? All right, cultural landscape is a very fancy phrase for basically what have people done to the land, right? Physically um, to it. So I like to use the phrase sequent occupants and it's basically the land was all perfect and pristine and then people came and some of them build houses that look X, some build houses that look Y, some people build churches, some people build these types of shops, they get involved with whatever it is. Societies all leave their cultural imprints differently. And so we can see here in this picture that early on the land is untouched. And then as people start to explore, move further in, it gets more and more different. Then factories start coming in, massive sky, skyscrapers, and all of these, these things start to change. And that's just called the success of society. And we can see it. I'm gonna actually give an example right here. Boom, here's a place. Oh my gosh, it's breathtaking, 1600, look at that. It's a beautiful little peninsula. Then 64 years later, oh, nice windmills. I like this, I like this. I wonder where this is. Okay, all right, seems to be more buildings. We can see a trend is more people, obviously. Wow, this place is really blossoming. I wonder what this place is, oh, oh, it's New York. So this is an example of cultural landscape. It's how did it go from this to this? And there's been lots of different societies, there's been lots of different groups. We have the Dutch, right? We have the English. We have now all these immigrants that came in the late 18, 1800s um, that change it still today. It's constantly changing. Cultural landscape is constantly changing, but it's the imprint that humans leave on society. Next, whew, diffusion. Diffusion can be broken up into some some different categories. The two biggest would be relocation and expansion. Relocation is what we'll look at first, all right? Expansion has three subsets, hierarchical, contagious, and stimulus. Let's go to relocation. I do not like horses, they're scary. But the horse is a great example of relocation to fusion because horses are from Central um, Asia, Europe, this area right here. This is where horses are from. Today, horses are found everywhere. Can horses swim? I've heard they can, but I don't think they can swim across oceans. So how did they get everywhere? Well, great question, Billy. What they did is the Spanish were like, hey, we should start exploring places in the late 1400s. So they put the horses on the boat because no one likes walking. They boat over to wherever they're going, right? North, Central, South America. They get off on the horses. Horses like each other. They're kind of like humans. Sometimes they hold hooves, and then one or two horses equals three, four. Next thing you know, we have relocation diffusion of all these horses they have just been coming all across the atlantic they came uh with some of the conquistadors the explorers the british everyone brings these horses and now they can be found everywhere so that would be an example of relocation diffusion you're literally moving the phenomenon from one place to another skipping the area all right my least favorite hier hierarchical diffusion this is when like popular people powerful people basically tell others right less powerful people like myself, what to do. We can see it in fashion. Fashion comes out of France, Paris. It comes out of Milan as well. But in Paris, we can see that they tell us that this is cool. Then it goes to other more influential places like in America, New York City, and LA. Then these people tell Americans like, hey, this is cool. And then these cities are told, hey, this is cool. Then where Mr. White lives down here, these places eventually find out this is cool. Hierarchical diffusion, we see it all the time. We see it on Instagram with influencers. They'll they'll have a product on and they'll use it and all their followers will go and buy it. We'll see it with uh, religious officials. They'll state like, you know, do this, follow this, and then all of their parishioners follow them. So hierarchical diffusion is typically a top to, actually it is a top to bottom uh, phenomenon and diffusing of information. Contagious diffusion is a little different. It doesn't have to go top to bottom. It's basically when something starts and it moves and it catches on and it spreads out. We can see this right here. It typically has to do with diseases. So imagine this disease, it's moving, it's spreading, it's, 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 it's wandering around. It could also be a fad. Maybe it's catching on, it's moving, it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just, it's, it's meant to describe the, the movement of an idea of a good here. All right, my favorite, stimulus diffusion. So diffusion means something is moving across time and space. Hamburgers, cheeseburgers, whatever you want to call it. McDonald's, this is an unpaid advertisement, P.S. McDonald's has 
Um, they didn't develop the hamburger, but they popularized it. And they wanted to sell other hamburgers all over the world, but they realized that not everyone in the world likes hamburgers like McDonald's makes hamburgers, but they like making money. So instead of selling this hamburger all over the world, they go to that place and they say, hey, what do y'all like to eat? So, like, for instance, they go to the Czech Republic. They put pork burgers and horseradish. They like it spicy. So give them the people what they want. In Japan, they love this teriyaki pork burger, right? Give them what they want. They don't want beef. They want this pork burger. Give it to them, right? Number one seller in Saudi Arabia is chicken. That's strange. They don't like pork because of religious restrictions, right? Jews and Muslims aren't allowed to eat pork if they're following halal and kosher um, you know, um, doctrine. In India, due to some religious restrictions, most McDonald's sell vegetarian um vegetarian burgers here like this one this is an example of stimulus diffusion it's taking this idea of this burger it's it's protein it's carbs it's some veggies it's some sauce and then sending it away to these other places to make it more appetizing or make it fall within their cultural norms and mores so if you go to a mcdonald's all over the world i encourage you to eat the local fare but if you go you'll see that there is stimulus diffusion occurring all right those are our types of diffusion. Know that expansion diffusion has three subsets. So those are some good examples. Now, let's look at historical diffusion. So historical diffusion occurred mostly, historical, we're talking about four or 500 years ago, uh, with the Colombian exchange, this movement of goods and ideas from the old world to the new. And this, this movement, right, from the new world back to the old. Look, at they didn't have tomatoes in Italy. How did they make pizza? I don't know. They didn't have coffee. How did they work? I don't know. Back in the East, how did they connect all these spices and uh, religions? Well, along the Silk Road. So that's historical diffusion. Modern day diffusion, though, is a little bit different. This is weird uh, abstract map. This is actually an airline map of every flight in the world going from wherever, you know, origin to destination. A lot of places are connected globally, right? Globalization is alive. YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. Because Without this medium, many, many ideas and, and fads and phenomena would not be able to diffuse. Language. Let's look at language. This is our last topic. So what you should know is language is a big part of culture. And some of the oldest languages studied, they, they believe they came out of this area. All right. This Fertile Crescent, Middle East, um, Tigris, Euphrates. And as people started you know, growing tired of each other, population starts swelling, people begin moving. Some move northwest, some move east, some move southwest, and that's the heart of language. We can see this movement. So most uh, linguists believe that the first and oldest languages are out of this area. Now, what causes languages to move? There's two theories here. One's called the conquest theory. This is when language will be brought in, like these are Spanish explorers, and they just tell people, hey, we're speaking Spanish now, right? The other one is people will start to move around uh, to find greener pastures, and they want they want to come in. They'll they'll bring in a new language. All right, so that's how language spread and diffused. But how do we get all these languages? We have tons. We have about eight thousand languages, and it's through this process known as language divergence. And language divergence is this idea that everyone spoke the same languages, and then as they move apart over time and space, distance decay here. All of a sudden, they become more and more different. So as there's more distance between them, the level of interaction is lower. And this starts to create dialects. Just like in America, we have in the South, right? I speak the Southern dialect of English. My uncle in the North, right? He speaks it's like this Boston dialect. We understand each other, but there are differences because of the distance and, and the interaction between us. And these are called sound shifts. And we really see it with the word milk. And in Latin, lact, Italian, latte, Spanish, leche, French, le. And milk, it's very similar, but we can see that these countries are all near each other, but their word for milk is slightly different. So this is how a new language is created with sound shifts, and this takes a very long time. What about the opposite of divergence, right? Convergence. This is when two languages kind of smash into each other headlong. Bluetopias and Yelionias, and now they speak greens, right? Great, great primary color, secondary color here. And a great example of this would be the country of Haiti. Haiti actually has what's known as a Creole language, and it's the blending of this native and this African languages with French, and this, they put them in a blender, and they have some words will be of African descent, some will be of French descent, some will be completely brand new 
and untraceable. But that is convergence and divergence. That's explaining how we get new languages. Now, how do you classify these languages? I really hope they don't ask about this, but if they do, you should know that here's the original languages and think of a tree. And uh, there's these branches, there's smaller branches, and there's leaves. So this is the oldest language we can see here. We have the Proto-European and we have, this is classified into language family. And half of all languages are what's known as Indo-European. We can see them here. There's 3,237 languages attributed to the Indo-Europeans. Basically means coming out of that area of um, Middle East. Then they move upwards further up. Now we have the branches. They share some sort of common origin, but there's been some, some evolution, some sound shifts, some changes. And then the last type is language group. And at the very top, we can see that we see our Spanishes, we see our Englishes. So English would be the group, the branch would be Germanic, and the family would be the Indo-European. The biggest thing you need to know College Board's going to ask is, which one's the biggest? It's Indo-European. They might say, what's the largest language? We can see from this proportional leaf here. It's going to be Mandarin off the Sino-Tibetan branch or family. That'll help you on languages. And I'm pretty confident you're going to take a dub on this thing in May. So Mr. White is out. You got this, right? I'm glad you didn't procrastinate so much so you didn't get to watch this video. Please like and subscribe.